This is a Commodore VIC-1001 computer from 1980. This is a particularly early VIC-1001 with serial number 100399. It's the second lowest VIC-1001 registered at cbmvic.net. That makes this the 399th VIC-1001 ever made. In this video, I'll give you a little tour of this machine inside and out, and I'll show you it working. Along the way, we'll dive a little wee bit into the history of these machines. So, let's get started. Depending where you live in the world, the Commodore VIC-20 is probably more well known to you than the VIC-1001. They're actually the same computer, but when Commodore initially released the VIC, it was limited to the Japanese market and was given the model number VIC-1001. The model number for the Japanese release came from Tony Tokai, the general manager at Commodore Japan Limited. According to Michael Tomchak, Tokai chose 1001 based on the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was a popular movie in Japan. I have to assume that since 2001 had already been taken by a pet model number, Tony chose the lower 1001 to represent a lower price tier for the entry-level VIC. The case itself was created by a designer named Nishi Morov from Commodore Japan Limited, who had previously done case designs for Commodore's electronic calculators. Unlike Commodore's original metal PET cases that were made by Commodore's own metal division, the VIC cases were injection-molded plastic. This same general case design was used for the duration of VIC production, and it went on to be used for the initial release of the Commodore 64 in 1982. Then it was also used for the Commodore 16 computer in 1984. To the untrained eye, all VIC cases look the same, but there were actually six different minor case revisions throughout the lifetime of the VIC. One feature that sets the early VIC-1001 case apart from all the later VIC-20 cases is that the VIC-1001 only has a single row of ventilation slots in the bottom case half. I'm going to open up the VIC-1001 now so you can look inside. This is the entire VIC-1001 board. I'm going to start up here with the MOS6560 video interface chip, commonly known as the VIC chip. One might assume that the video chip that's the core of the VIC computer was designed for this computer, but that's not actually the case. Al Charpentier was hired by MOS Technology in 1975 immediately after he graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. He began work on the MOS 6560 VIC chip in 1976 after Commodore purchased MOS. Commodore did not intend to build a computer around the VIC chip. MOS was already selling various chips to console manufacturers like Coleco and Atari, and they expected a console manufacturer would purchase their new VIC chip. Al completed the VIC in 1977, and Commodore met with Atari reps to demo the VIC for them, hoping Atari would use it in a game console. However, Atari wasn't interested. In January 1978, at the Winter CES, Commodore had their VIC chip on display, but they still didn't manage to attract any buyers. In 1979, Jack Trammell, the founder of Commodore, directed his West Coast engineering team to begin work on a new color computer. Chuck Peddle would oversee the project with Bill Seiler as the primary engineer and John Fagans lending his expertise as needed. These West Coast engineers were the primary people who had already successfully designed and launched the Commodore PET computer. Despite Commodore already having L Charpentier's MOS 6560 color video chip available to them, the West Coast engineering team never considered using it for their design because they felt the 22-column display would be too limited for a computer. Seiler began working with the East Coast MOS engineering team consisting of Al Charpentier and Bob Yanis 
to have them develop a new MOS 6562 40 column video chip for their new computer, which Bill Seiler was calling TOI, spelled T-O-I. Chuck Peddle gave it the backronym of The Other Intellect. It seemed as though Commodore had wasted the R&D expenses that went into creating the VIC. However, by April 1980, Toy was stalled waiting on a 6564 chip that the East Coast MOS engineers were now working on, and at least two other prototype color pet computers, one developed by Bob Yanis and one by Commodore Japan, failed to materialize. In April 1980, Commodore held an international manager's meeting at the Burnham Beaches, an old mansion in the outskirts of London. Michael Tomchak, often referred to as the marketing father of the VIC-20, was newly hired by Commodore and was in attendance. Chuck Peddle was here to pitch his vision of moving Commodore into the high-end business computer market segment. But while visiting the UK, Jack Trammell saw the Sinclair ZX80 computer selling for under 100 pounds. It was decided that Commodore would do a small color computer and they would show it at the upcoming summer CES in June 1980 in Chicago. In May 1980, Bob Yanis began working on a Sinclair killer based on the original MOS 6560 VIC chip, which he dubbed MicroPet. Shortly after, the West Coast team quickly rolled out a prototype of their own, which Siler called G-Job, short for Garage Job. Jack Trammell chose Bob Yanis' MicroPet as the design which would become the VIC-20. Back to the VIC-1001 board, and we now know how the 6560 ended up being used with the VIC-20. Let's explore the rest of the board. The VIC-20 used an MOS 6502 CPU, much like the PET and Kim-1 before it. This is unsurprising given that Commodore owned MOS now, and MOS created the 6502. Also similar to the PET before it, the VIC-20 used MOS 6522 Versatile Interface Adapter Chips, or VIA chips, for I.O. and timer functions. The dataset connector on the VIC-20 was borrowed from the PET also, including the edge connector and the pin configuration. Commodore's dataset drives were compatible with the PET and the VIC-20. It sure looks like a lot of the original Commodore PET design was borrowed for the VIC-20, doesn't it? I guess that makes sense given that Bob Yanis' concept was named MicroPET, but that's not really how the design came about. The MicroPET was an extremely rudimentary concept that could only run simple demos out of ROM. There was no operating system, there was no basic, and there was no way to load programs from tape. The rejected West Coast G-Job design that was created by the same team who created the PET had all of that functionality. Regardless, when the MicroPET concept was chosen by Jack Trammell, the East Coast MOS team went back to work on other projects, and the West Coast team went back to work on toy. A young engineer named Robert Russell was given the task of taking MicroPET from concept to a finished product. Bob Russell had recently been recruited from Iowa State University by John Fagans, and he had not been involved with either of the prototype projects. He was primarily a software developer, and he had no previous experience in system design. He was given just six weeks to complete the design. Bob Russell was working on the West Coast, but he worked at the Scott Boulevard facility. Pedal's team, who had extensive experience in system design, was working out of the Moore Park Avenue R&D lab about 10 minutes away. Chuck Peddle had no incentive to have his team provide any assistance to Bob Russell on the Vic project, which Russell had now codenamed Vixen. As far as Peddle was concerned, his team's design had not been chosen, so Russell was on his own. Fortunately for Bob Russell, he was able to convince Bill Seiler to unofficially help him with the project, and eventually the toy work was pushed aside and the rest of Peddle's engineers also assisted. Incidentally, it was Bob Russell who came up with a second backronym for the toy computer, referring to it hilariously and derisively as Tool of Idiots. Now we know why the system architecture of the VIC is so similar to the PET. The same team who created the PET were also instrumental in doing the VIC's system architecture. Let's take a look at the rest of the board now. These two ROMs are the basic and kernel ROMs. When the PET was being developed, John Fagans wrote all the stuff to make it work that Chuck Peddle had not already written. It was John who separated Microsoft's basic interpreter parsing out to a clean ROM interface, creating the distinction between the kernel operating system ROM and the basic ROM. For the Vixen project, John Fagans ported his PET kernel and basic ROM code over to run on these two ROMs on the VIC board. Over here is the character ROM. 
Everything else between the VIC-1001 and VIC-20 is functionally equivalent, except the character ROMs. On the VIC-1001, the uppercase characters from Care Set 2 were replaced with Katakana characters. I don't have enough time in the video to go through it in detail, but you can check out the URL shown on the screen for more info if you're interested. That's all for the board. Now I'll talk about the ports and connectors on the back of the VIC. The user port is on the right. This uses the same 24-pin edge connector as the PET, but the pinouts are not the same, and user port devices are not hardware compatible between the PET and the VIC. The cassette connector, I already mentioned, it's the same as the PET's cassette connector. The IEC serial connector was new to the VIC. The physical IEEE 488 bus connectors that were used on the PET were considered to be too large and too expensive to use on the low-cost VIC. So a serial implementation of the IEEE 488 bus was created. Glenn Stark did the hardware design. Bob Russell, Glenn Stark, and Steve Harris ported the IEEE 488 bus code from the PET and converted it to use IEC protocol for the VIC kernel. This audio video connector was also new for the VIC. The PET had an integrated monitor and did not require a video output, and the PET didn't natively have sound capabilities. The cartridge connector was designed by Bill Seiler specifically for the VIC. The PET didn't have a cartridge port. Finally, the VIC-1001 has a joystick port which the PET didn't have. Bob Russell chose this standard 9-pin D-sub connector intentionally because it was already being popularly used on the Atari 2600. In July 1980, the United States engineers completed their VIC design and handed it off to Tony Tokai and Yash Terakura from Commodore Japan Limited to have them move the design into production. Michael Tomchak began to conceptualize a marketing strategy for the Vixen, which included these early ad sketches that he did, which focused on price and ease of use for the customer. There was also thought given to additional sources of revenue from add-on items for the Vixen. In this telex to Tony Tokai, we see that Michael was also involved in coordinating production planning with Commodore Japan. It's suggested here to use a rainbow in the nameplate to indicate that the VIC is a color computer, but we know that didn't happen until later revisions of the VIC-20 badge. Tony's reply indicates that everything was in place to start production on or around October 20th, 1980. It's not mentioned in this telex, but initial VIC-1001 production began at a company named Japanese Cash Register as a subcontractor to Commodore Japan Limited. The VIC-1001 was introduced to the world during an event at Cebu Department Store in Tokyo, Japan from September 19th through 24th, 1980. The user manual was also mentioned in Tony's Telex, and it stated that Commodore US would be handling it. The original user manual was written by the publications group in Santa Clara and sent to Japan. It came back from Japan as the VIC-1001 manual, and John Fagan's wife, Sumiko Nagahama, translated it back to English. One of Michael Tomchak's core marketing principles was that the VIC-20 would be a friendly computer. Michael felt that the VIC-1001 user manual wasn't friendly enough, so he hired a company named Redgate Communications to write a new manual in December 1980. The manual that Redgate created didn't meet Michael's expectations, so when Neil Harris was hired by Commodore in January of 1981, his first project was to write a user-friendly VIC-20 manual from scratch. The result of Neil's work is the friendly computer guide that came with the Commodore VIC-20. I said at the beginning of the video I'd show you this VIC-1001 in action, so I'll do that now. I mentioned the Katakana character set being unique to the 1001, so software written for the VIC-1001 could use those characters. Unfortunately, any software developers who were unaware of the VIC-1001 and happened to use the capital letters from Care Set 2 would render Katakana unintentionally.